Um, so we're going to go on and discuss uh, imaging. And this is really a very relevant area to be discussing. A lot of times you go to oncology meetings and you hear, especially someone like ASCO, it's, it's all biology. But if you really look back over the course of 30, 40 years, the changes in imaging uh, and the changes coming through the technological and the biological sciences have been at least as great, if not greater, than the changes in the uh, biologic ther therapeutics that we have. There have been major changes there. But you go back uh, within my career, uh, and it was really when CT scans were just starting to appear, MRI scans was what's well, a what's that? And um, the technology simply didn't exist. And we couldn't even conceive of devising uh, therapies, devising diagnosis and all without these technological changes. And so we have a group of speakers today, uh, very unusual in one sense for a somewhat clinical meeting in that all of our speakers have PhDs. Uh, but uh, at least three of them are certainly very active uh, clinicians. And we're going to discuss imaging from a variety of, of perspectives. And we're going to start off with a talk uh, by uh, Terry Wong um, on uh, imaging approaches in using PET and, and CT. Terry is an associate professor in nuclear medicine at, at uh, Duke, and we're looking forward to his presentation. Terry. So what I'd like to do uh, today in updating S on PET is talk about uh, the current status using FDG um, and make some remarks about quantification of this, and then talk about some new tracers, which I put in quotes because uh, a lot of these have been in use clinically um, overseas, but not here. So looking at the evolution of FDG PET, um, we started when the CMS was approving it to move um, from a paradigm of staging before treatment and then restaging following completion of therapy to look at response. Starting about 2005, it became recognized that PET can be used to determine response to therapy earlier than anatomic imaging, and a great interest uh, was used here to see uh, what the significance of this was. And I think moving on now, um, PET, FDG PET is being used for adaptive therapy, where it's actually an integral part of the treatment plan. And so the traditional paradigm of doing a PET um, at the time of diagnosis is baseline, and then re-imaging um, after completion of therapy to see the response um, is kind of being advanced to looking earlier on. So earlier on in therapy, after maybe one or two cycles of chemotherapy, um, can we look at the early response and can we predict the outcome, the prognosis, and most importantly, is this an opportunity to change therapy if the patient is not responding metabolically? Probably one of the best examples that I'm sure you're all familiar with is lymphoma, particularly Hodgkin's disease. Um, and an example here is a young person with uh, um, Hodgkin's lymphoma, and you can see the disease in the lung here. Um, one of our challenges is to distinguish this disease from adenopathy and brown fat, which is metabolically active, that we see here. But um, prior to therapy, we see this lung opacity with very high FDG activity. And the plan was um, a therapeutic protocol, which was uh, ABVE, and then an interim PET-CT at two cycles. And you can see the post-two cycle um, scan on the right, and now we see that that mass has significantly decreased, and there's still a little amount of activity here. And one of the challenges remain, you know, uh, lymphoma is one of the best responding um, on FDG uh, tumor types, but uh, the question is still how much of a response do we expect? Um, it's good enough that we can evaluate visually, um, but there is still um, work to be done on what is the criteria here, and we usually use other uh, tissues as a, as a comparison, so liver or blood pool, and um, so there's still um, interest in how to interpret these and when is it really considered a complete response. Um, we consider this a complete response, and if you look at this, 
After two cycles, we can see that it's reduced, but that after four cycles, it's even more reduced. And this patient was indeed NED after two years. So in Hodgkin's, you know, there's a lot of data um, with FDG-PET. And so what are the applications this could be used to modify therapy for uh, unfavorable Hodgkin's disease, perhaps stratification for radiation therapy, or de-intensification of therapy um, for favorable uh, Hodgkin's disease patients. And some uh, trials are taking advantage of this. Um, some of the collaborative groups are looking into this as well, where you do an initial staging PET and then look at early response after two cycles of the standard ABVD and then escalate it if there's uh, not a, a response. Looking at other tumors which don't respond quite as rapidly as lymphoma, uh, don't expect you to be able to read all of these, but what this shows is that for different uh, tumor sites, the response criteria for early response is a little bit different and requires a quantitative measurement of uh, activity in, in terms of what we use SUV. And we can see here that in order to determine an early response, whereas in lymphoma, it, it can be determined visually. In these others, you have to quantify it, and we're looking on the order of about 20 to 40 percent decrease in the activity, or SUV. And as an example, I'm going to uh, take esophagus. And this is a, a tumor site that's been well characterized um, as far as response to therapy. And multiple studies show that a 30 to 35 percent decrease in SUV after a couple cycles of chemotherapy will uh, make a difference um, in response uh, overall. And so as an example, a CLGB80803, which started uh, uh, earlier this year, um, patients with esophageal cancer are randomized to one of two chemos, Folfox-6 or carboplatin plaquetaxel. They receive a PET, an early PET response, and then if the SUV max shows a response, in other words, it decreases by 35 percent or more, the same chemo regimen is continued and th a radiation therapy is added. If there's not a response, as defined by less than a 35 percent change in SUV max, then uh, the chemo is crossed over. So this kind of uh, study, uh, as a radiologist, um, uh, very excited that uh, PET is included as part of the uh, treatment. On the other hand, uh, it's also a, a little um, anxiety provoking in that uh, now, you know, this measurement uh, becomes critical into the decision making of the patient treatment. And so just to um, look at the SUV that we're using, um, these are, it's a very simple equation, and that's the, that's the importance of it. Um, and it's called standardized uptake value, but how standardized is it? And I just want to point out that if you take a phantom and you put a known uh, quantity of, of radio tracer in it, so you have an SUV of one, and you, you, you scan this and you make the measurement, you can do very well. So all these different scanners, uh, regardless of the reconstruction algorithm, um, with this large phantom, you can get your, your uh, target SUV of one. The problem is that if you look at uh, scans, you can see that these scans are in the same patient, but just done on different scanners, and they look quite different. And this is because of the reconstruction algorithms, the acquisition technology. And so in real patients um, and real lesions, the SUV can be different depending on the scanner and um, these, the reconstruction algorithm, so you have different SUVs. <laughs> and so it's important when we move from single institution studies looking at response to therapy with PET scanning to multi-institutional studies that quality control is very important and that uh, we recognize that SUVs really aren't standardized when you uh, have different scanners in and that a lot of attention to detail is needed to do these studies successfully. Um, you need, ideally, to use the same scanner. Um, be careful with those parameters that are used to measure the SUV, the patient weight and dose. Synchronizing the clocks of the scanner and dose calibrator, maintaining same time the imaging, 
and the same acquisition parameters, for example. So tight quality assurance is essential for these multi-institutional trials, and uh, the CLGB has uh, provided that with the core labs, and um, this is something that's going to be important moving forward um, with these uh, clinical trials involving PET. And I think from the imaging end, we have to do more to try to improve the quantification and make it more standardized so that it's not so dependent on these other technical uh, parameters. So in terms of FDG PET, and quantitative imaging is going to become more important. Um, in, in the best case scenario in a single institution, the reproducibility is about 10 percent from scan to scan, and we need to accurately resolve about 20 to 40 percent for early response. And this has been shown to be feasible in single institution studies, but uh, it will be more challenging with a multi-institutional setting, and this is uh, something that we uh, need to be uh, aware of. The second topic I want to talk about in general are other tracers besides the FDG, and there are many different uh, targets and tracers um, that are of potential interest in, the, in oncology physiology, um, and I'm going to just talk uh, briefly about some of these that I think are soon on the horizon. And before that, I um, want to want everybody to recognize that, you know, F F18 is an isotope that's most commonly used, but there's other PET isotopes, positron emitters, um, that can be used. Carbon-11, nitrogen-13, and O15 are cyclotron-produced and generally limited to sites where there's a cyclotron nearby because of the short half-life. F18 is most commonly used routinely because the half-life is long enough such that it can be distributed nationally. And so there's a lot of um, there's a, a lot of pressure to actually design radio tracers using F18. But I also want to uh, point out that there are other alternatives too. And these two isotopes happen to be produced by generators. And uh, I'll give you some examples of this. But this is a very short half-life uh, isotope, 9.7 minutes, and gallium 68 has a 68-minute half-life. And these both can be generator produced. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these new uh, PET tracers as examples. Um, and I say new again because a lot of these have been used overseas, some of these for over 10 years. But there's uh, due to uh, several hurdles here uh, in the US, um, it takes longer for them to become adapted to routine clinical use here. First, I'll talk about uh, gallium-68 octreotide analogs. And this is a gallium-68 generator. Um, this is uh, nearing FDA approval. It's commercially available. The uh, half-life of this is about a year. So you buy one of these generators, and this will supply your gallium-68 for a year. The half-life of the parents is 270 days. Um, and you know the big advantage is no cyclotron is needed. So this has potential for more uh, routine use at many sites. And the chemistry is such that a lot of radio tracers can be used with uh, gallium-68. But the current uh, main PET application is for neuroendocrine tumors and using an octreotide analog uh, similar to the uh, indium-111 octreotide. And this, this meets a need because neuroendocrine tumors generally have low uh, FDG metabolism. So here are some of the molecules used, um, the DOTA agents uh, that can be tagged for uh, labeling neuroendocrine tumors. And uh, thanks to Rich Baum for this. But um, in Germany, at, at this uh, center, they do over 1,000 gallium-68 PET scans a year. And the advantages, just in this example, over the conventional indium-111 octreotide uh, are many. It's a more sensitive. Um, you're doing it with PET-CT, so you can incorporate high-end CT with this. Um, for the patient, it's a single-day, single imaging study. So for the indium study, imaging is done at 4 and 24 hours, and inspect imaging is done, whereas the PET-CT, all of this can be done within a couple of hours. And uh, finally, this offers the opportunity for accurate quantification. So here's a comparison of a planar image of indium-111. Octrea scan versus uh, gallium-68, and you can see many more lesions, the increased sensitivity of this. 
um, and indium spec up here at the top. And this takes several hours. Each of these takes maybe 45 minutes for each of these spec images. And remember, this is 24 hours after injecting, whereas all of this PET is accomplished um, over uh, a couple hours start to finish. And you can see uh, much more, uh, many more uh, lesions in the gallium uh, 68 PET. In addition, uh, by labeling the DOTA TUP, for example, with the gallium 68, you can substitute therapeutic beta emitters such as yttrium 90 or lutetium um, 177 and uh, use this for uh, a matching therapy um, to the imaging. The uh, other the next tracer I want to talk about is F18 FLT, and um, this is beginning to be used more in clinical trials. This is a marker for cell proliferation. Um, it really runs by the exogenous or salvage pathway and not the endogenous, all upregulated with DNA um, synthesis. Um, unlike carbon-11, thymidine is not incorporated um, in the uh, DNA, um, but uh, trapped in the cell that way. And you um, might think that this could be more valuable in looking at response to therapy by looking at direct, more directly at cell proliferation. This is a study comparing FDG and FLT in esophageal cancer. And in the uh, primary cancer, we see that they have a very similar um, distribution to mark the tumor. But one of the advantages is that the FDG is susceptible to post-treatment inflammation um, from radiation therapy, whereas the FLT um, is more selective in looking at tumor proliferation. So it doesn't have that, um, that problem as uh, seen with FDG. Another example with, um, with lung cancer, um, we can see response to therapy after two grays of radiation and after 10 gray. Um, we can see that one of the um, problems or potential problems with FLT is the high marrow and liver activity, and this may make it difficult to assess tumors in certain um, regions. Hypoxia markers, there's a, a lot of interest in this, um, and there's um, several um, F18 agents uh, that are being investigated, as well as uh, uh, copper agents. Um, these are redox compounds, and they're reduced under hypoxic conditions where they're trapped selectively in hypoxic cells. But this allows uh, for steady state PET imaging and is amenable to routine clinical use and perhaps treatment planning. Here's an example of um, 18 FF MISO um, compared to FDG, and we can see one of the issues with hypoxia agents is the target to background isn't nearly as high as what we're used to with FDG, um, but we can see accumulation in um, this hypoxic uh, head and neck cancer. One of the interesting things about this is um, you're all, I'm sure, familiar with the study. Um, Tirapazamine uh, is a hypoxia um, activated uh, cytotoxic agent. And um, the study of, of this where patients were randomized to cisplatin versus um, 5-FU versus tirapazamine um, was a negative study. So tirapazamine did not um, improve uh, survival or time to recurrence. But in a subset of this large study, uh, about 50 patients um, received f -miso. And this was observational, not part of the, the uh, formal study. But if you divide up the patients that were f -miso positive, um, you can see a difference here in the, uh, the uh, survival curves from the uh, uh, terapazamine group versus the 5-FU group here. So this at least brings up the suggestion that perhaps patient selection, um, if it were done using some hypoxic uh, marker, um, could perhaps stratify patients which would more likely benefit from an agent such as terapazamine. And this was further emphasized um, more recently in an editorial uh, by Dr. Brown. Um, and this is probably, this may be the next generation hypoxic imaging agent, EF5. And this could be the next um, hypoxic cytotoxic agent, um, CEN209. And these have the same, uh, use the same reductive enzymes. And so, you know, as an example here in this head and neck tumor, both, both lesions here take up F18 FDG, but one takes up the hypoxic agent and the other one doesn't, and this would be more ex uh, expected to respond to uh, this hypoxic uh, agent. An 
in addition, this is another um, generator produced uh, isotope, copper 62, and this again has the half life of about 10 minutes. And this, so this enables multiple PET imaging during the same session. So um, this was, uh, we, we did a few of these patients um, down the street from here. And uh, so we could do uh, PTSM PET as a marker of perfusion, ATSM PET as a marker of hypoxia, and then inject with F18 FDG and do that scan. So these were all done the same day. And we can kind of get a, a profile of these lesions. And in this adenocarcinoma, it was positive in all three. Um, another lesion here, which looks exactly the same on um, CT scan and FDG PET, um, was positive per, for perfusion, but negative for hypoxia. So multiple uh, parameters can be studied in a, in a similar um, setting. And the final uh, tracers I want to talk about are um, membrane synthesis, um, because prostate cancer is another blind spot for FDG. So there's an interest in uh, several uh, tracers that may be useful for prostate cancer. Um, Ed Coleman and Tim DeGrado uh, were instrumental in developing a way to label choline with F18. And uh, this is some of the initial work there showing that the SUV, the accumulation is much higher in, in a prostate adenocarcinoma compared to um, FDG PET. And um, in uh, some uh, study by uh, the HD, um, it, it can localize the uh, tumor um, compared to the PATH section. And it uh, may be useful in looking at uh, early nodal disease. Um, as shown here, so nodal staging of prostate cancer, which we really can't do effectively with FDG. The weakness of this and, uh, and many of the others is really detecting small or early involved nodes where the tumor density isn't that high, and this remains one of the uh, limitations of some of these uh, agents. So in conclusion, um, as far as FDG PET, I think uh, we're moving from uh, staging to restaging to early response. And now uh, a lot of interest in adaptive therapy where FDG PET is an integral part of the uh, therapy design. The main uh, challenge here is really quantification, both from the imaging standpoint and improving the ways we quantify it and the quality assurance um, in the trials um, to be maintained uh, as we move to multi-institutional studies. Beyond FDG, there's some promising PET tracers on the horizon, um, looking at cell proliferation on hypoxia, for example. And in addition, the interest in targeting malignancies that have traditionally low FDG uptake. Not all tracers need a cyclotron, and uh, you know, there, there could be a, a market or a way to use uh, generator-produced tracers um, for more widespread availability and potentially lower cost. And in the future, um, hopefully, we're going to have a menu of PET tracer options for metabolic profiling of tumors, um, which will eventually aid in um, guiding therapy. Thank you.